Kip, what's up, brother? Great to see you after uh, after the weekend. I just found out it's, as of this recording, it's President's Day. I think we were talking about fake holidays the other day. Yep. And I found sure. out because I had a bunch of stores, or a bunch of stores, a bunch of orders from the store and went over to the post office and it was closed. I'm like, what in the world? So I had to jump <laughs> online and they said it's President's Day or Washington's birthday. My wife told me that because uh, our oldest son was going to go have a, a sleepover with one of his buddies. And I said, doesn't he have school tomorrow? And and she said, no, it's February break. I'm like, February break? And I can't help but wonder now if that they call it February break because they don't want to offend anybody that it's Washington's birthday or that it's President's Day. Uh, I don't know. The whole world has just lost its dang mind. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I um I went on a rant. When was it? It was um just a few months ago. I was irate about this, but check this out. It's similar that the state of Utah, um, the courts were determining whether they would change um, if Halloween would fall on a different day in the event that Halloween fell on the 31st and, and that they would change the official holiday. And, and I'm like, who, who gave them, who gives a crap what they think? Ultimately they're in control of the holiday, right? Like we're going to do Wait, what we do, right? Why like, don't I they, you said they didn't want it on the 31st? Dollars. Well, no, like in the event that Halloween fell on a Sunday, they were putting like law in place that oh. like the holiday would be on a different day in the event been on the 31st. And it's like, and we need the government to do that for us, right? Like who gives well, you a know crap, why they do right? that? But it just oh, it drives me mad. They're doing it so no. they can get their day off. That's what, that's yeah. all, that's the only reason <laughs> the government's like, let's put this law in place. Cause if it's Sunday, we don't get a day off, but if we make this holiday on a Monday or a Friday, then we get a three day weekend. Actually, we could probably stretch it out to a four day weekend. That's why they yeah. do that. It's nonsense. It's stupid. It is yeah. stupid. It's ridiculous. But you know what? I'll say this part of the problem, a, a large part of the problem is that we see these things and, and that's pretty benign you know, in the grand yeah. scheme of things, there's, there's significantly bigger issues. And I'm not saying we don't need to discuss what you're talking about, but we, as men who are hardworking, we care about our families, we care about virtue and we have values and, and we want to do right by our families and businesses and communities. We spend a lot of time focused on doing just that, keeping our head down, going to work, doing our job well, trying to serve in our communities trying to raise our kids, like those are the things that we're doing. And that's all very noble. Yeah. But if we are not speaking up and speaking out, not just about when holidays fall, again, pretty benign, but if we're not speaking out against transgenderism, against mutilation of children, against abortion, against a woke ideology being taught to our young children in public schools about dangerous critical race theory concepts in our schools. Like if we're not talking about these issues in a loud, credible, convicted way, we deserve everything that we have coming. And I, I just, at this point, mm. I don't think that we can say that we're the men that we're capable of being and that we should be being if we're so hyper-focused on just our own and not turning that attention outwards and trying to affect society and culture on a broader sense. We have to be making ourselves capable of, of managing ourselves well, helping lead our families and our communities, and then turning that outwards to attempt to at least stop, if not reverse, the, tri the, the, the trend of this degenerate culture that, that continues to permeate just about all of society at this point. I totally agree with you, Ryan. There are elements of individuals though, right? When we look at like, and I'm, I'm just stealing this from Jordan Peterson, right? Where, you know, he, he makes the point that a lot of people latch on to social issues um, because they're avoiding taking responsibility for the things actually happening in their own home. <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Like sure. those things are falling apart. And so then they go, they become social justice warriors because that gives them a sense of purpose. Meanwhile, back at home, Things are falling apart. They're not showing up powerfully and they're not taking care of the higher priority items. And I know you agree with that. I just, 
I, I like what you said and and maybe add to the idea that like we do need to be showing up powerfully at home as well. You know what I mean? And then and then moving on outside of that circle of influence and taking on broader things. Would you agree or anything you'd add to that? Yeah, of course I would agree. And look, I, I, I'm in an interesting position and you are as well, uh, in that I am attempting to move the needle about masculinity and manliness in society. Broadly, I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to reach as many people as possible. So I don't want to, I don't want anybody to assume that I think I have it all figured out or that I have everything completely locked down within the walls of my home or even how I show up. Uh, we were reading yesterday in, in church from Romans and Paul, who, you know, we tend to think of as this incredible man, this, this disciple who, you know, is, is intimately familiar with Jesus and the gospel and God and, and what a righteous and moral man should do. And yet in his, in his writings, he talks about how he knows what he should be doing. And yet even him, Paul, finds it hard to actually do it. So yeah. we, are, we are mortal creatures. We are tempted by the flesh. And, and, and I'm not suggesting that we have to have everything perfect, but you're right, Kip, we should be locking ourselves down. And that's what gives us the right to then go out and impact society. Uh, yeah. You got to do both and you can do both. It's important. Yeah. And I think a distinction that we make sometimes uh, in the Iron Council is you at least have to be on the path, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, we don't expect our guys to be perfect. We don't run teams. We don't run a community where the expectation is perfect. No, but we do expect our guys within our council to, to be on the path. And when they fall off the path, that's okay, but you need to get back on the path, right? And, and, and on the path of becoming a better man, on the path of accountability, on the path of integrity. And that's the expectation, not perfection. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's a, an important distinction because that gives us some grace and some empathy for those men around us and realizing like, hey, we're not perfect, but the expectation is that we're trying, right? And that we're not blindly or intentionally avoiding our responsibility and, and latching onto something else, right? There, there's an attempt to be on the path and do what's right. I think there's an issue with a lot of guys with imposter syndrome who believe that because they may not have things perfect or they may struggle with a particular thing or had issues in the past with financial issues uh, legal issues, medical issues, relational issues that somehow they're no longer qualified to share. And I would actually suggest it's the opposite. If you've yeah. gone through financial issues and you figured out a way to be better moving forward, which is what we should all strive for, then I think you're more qualified to talk about what to do and what not to do. Uh, if you've yeah. gone through serious health conditions, but you've managed to lose weight and get in shape and get strong and self-correct some of those medical uh, debilitating diseases and illnesses that you might have been dealing with, then you're more qualified to walk another man through how you did it. So please, guys, don't disqualify yourself because you happen to have a medical issue that was self-induced or uh, a relationship that went sour or you were tempted to do something or you had legal issues in the past. Some of the guys that I follow are, are guys who had some of the most extreme issues that you'd ever imagine and they've overcome it. And that's why I listen. That's why they're it's relatable. Exactly. Exactly. And they actually know it's like going to a therapist, a marriage counselor who's never been married. Now they can read you all <laughs> of the book information and it's not wrong. It's probably not wrong if they go through the book, but in practice, they've never implemented it. And so it'd be very difficult to take somebody like that serious because obviously what we see in a book is different than the inner personal dynamics between husband and wife. Yeah. I like it. All right, That's man. Let's get to some questions today. Should we yeah, get some for questions? sure. All right. Do it. All right. So we're going to field questions from um, our, the iron council to learn more about the iron council, go to order of man.com slash iron council. All right, Matt. Hey, uh, Kip, Pachuni. one second on that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me over the past week or two when the Iron Council is opening back up, and I would just want to let you guys know, mid-March, so roughly three weeks, we're going to open the Iron Council back up. It'll be open for a couple of weeks, uh, and then we'll start getting after it um, in April. So just just be aware of that. Be on the lookout. You can go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council to get on the waiting list 
and to be notified March 15th when we open it back up. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Matt uh, Fuccini. Matt Matu Matusi? Matusi. It's Matusi. <laughs> Matt Matusi. Sorry. Or is it right. Matucci? I don't know. I I I don't have it pulled up. Yeah. So Matt will right. let us know. Well, let us know, Matt. It's sorry, Matt. All right. My commute can be two hours each day. I work uh one to work and one back, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. I listen to a lot of books, podcasts, which make the drive easy, but my hands and head are focused on driving. And this makes it so that I don't bookmark or complete remember good information because I cannot act on it in that moment. For example, I challenge uh, or framework to grow myself coming up in a, in a book. What is a way to retain this information, revisit it, or should I accept it as entertainment with some of the snippets of info I do remember? Yeah, I think having entertainment, there's actually value in that. And you will pick up a lot of this through osmosis. It is going to happen. But yeah, there might be a certain framework or maybe there was a quote or something that really resonates with you deeply that you'd like to learn more about or ponder a little bit more deeply. So I would suggest uh, an app on your phone. I actually don't know if you, if like with Siri, if Siri will make a note for you. I, I think it probably will. If you say, Hey Siri, make a note and and ha and write down a note. Just use audio features on your phone. So that's what I would suggest. If something comes up, you might even just write uh, chapter three, page 24 or chapter three, 24 minutes and 10 seconds. And then that way, when you get home or in the morning, the next morning, when you have some time, you can pull that little note list up that you just made through your audio features and go back and review whatever it is that you wanted to review. Um, that's really the only way that you can do it. If you don't really have access to pausing and, yeah. and, and delving deeper into a particular subject, but that's one thing that I've done. Cause I usually listen, I listen to a lot of audio books when I'm working out, I listen to podcasts or audio books while I'm working out. And so that'll usually take me about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, and yeah, I'm not going to actually even no. even when I do work out, I do stop and I just make a quick note about a particular thing that was said or a topic that was broached. So I, I think that's what I would do, you know, take, yeah. take what you can, but if there is something deeply profound, Hey Siri, make a note about this and then go back and revisit it. Don't yeah. think that you're going to memorize, you remember it though. Just know that yeah. you're not going to remember it. You know, one thing I do, I don't have my phone. It's charging right now. But one thing I do is when I, when I see something that triggers a thought for me that I might want to share on a Friday field notes or on Twitter or Instagram pertaining to a certain subject is I'll just go in a note in a note section on my phone and just write that down. And I have note sections for Friday field notes, uh, group posts, uh, Instagram posts. And so I just put it under the corresponding title every once in a while. I'm like, Oh, I'm not going to write that down. I'll remember it. And five minutes later, I have no idea what it was. So you have to have a way to document that. And I would just use voice apps to be able to do it. I've done that same thing so many times. So and, frustrating. And I can relate to Matt so well because all the time I'll be listening to a book and I'm like, man, this is profound. And then what I'll do, this is what I do. I'll pause. I'm like, I'm going to stop listening because then I'm going to listen to this book later. And then I'm never finishing the damn book <laughs> because yeah. I'm constantly pausing it because I, I, I want to listen to it later. And then I never actually get through it. And so I don't know. I, I struggle with this a lot. Like I need a system unfortunately. And, and I think sometimes it's like, I, I, what I, I, what I have realized, like one book in particular right now is I can't listen to that book while driving mm. because it's too good. And I want to write down too many things. And so it is yeah. no longer an auto audible book for driving. Now I've, I've moved on and I only listen to that book when I can take notes because it's, that's good. You know, I, I want to take notes. So but uh, I, I guess I'm just relating I, to Max. I have the same. I problem. have another <laughs> idea on this, and I was just—I don't want to encourage anybody to be distracted while they're driving. I actually made yeah. that decision Full a long disclosure. time ago because I used to do uh, videos while I was yeah, driving. Yeah, I used to do posts while driving. Yeah, yeah. and somebody had said something like, "Why do you do that?" And I, and at first I was like, "Cause this is the only time," you know, got defensive or whatever. But I thought yeah. about it more. I'm like, "Oh no, he's right. I should, probably shouldn't be." driving while I'm doing a video or writing or like I sh we shouldn't be doing that. So yeah. I'm not encouraging being distracted, but here's a thought. I, this might be stupid, but what if you just had a dry erase marker on your, uh, 
on your, your dashboard. And if something came yeah. up, you just wrote on your window, 24 minutes and two seconds. <laughs> I've taken a picture. I've yeah, taken a picture work. of audible. So I have that note. Now I don't have a note. I just took a quick picture and then I have to like right. go to that spot in the book and listen again and try to hopefully yeah. remember whatever I was thinking. But this is yeah. actually how I read. This isn't pertaining to the question, but this is how I actually read books is I never read books without a highlighter. So what I'll do is I'll read the book. And if there's a particular paragraph or subject or quote that really resonates with me, I'll do a little dog ear on the page and then I'll highlight that paragraph or that line. And then I'll just keep reading along. Then I'll finish the book. And at the end of that, when I'm done with the book, I go back and I review every single page that I dog eared or highlighted. And I might organize that information. I might do something with that information or maybe, you know, just read it again and it triggers something else for me. But that's a way that I read, I read books. And that has been very, very helpful for me to actually apply things that are being taught from the book. What are you reading right now or listening to Kip? Limitless by Jim Quick. I've, I've read the majority like of it that before. Book. Yeah, I do. I, I really like it, but I'm nerding out on it because the, the fo focus of the book is from the individual perspective. But at work, I'm over learning and development. And so I'm kind of like, hey, you know what? These are principles that should make their way into the workplace, into corporate America. And so I've been really kind of deep diving into it again, because I'm like, man, I, I want to regurgitate this and establish it as a standard, if that makes sense. So yeah, very cool. But yeah, I think that's yeah. good. Taking that information, reading it again, doing something applicable with it. Uh, I'm reading a book. I can't remember who it's by. Uh, I'm I'm reading and listening. It's called uh, Live Not by Lies. And it talks mm -hmm. about uh, Soviet totalitarianism and how the soft totalitarianism, totalitarianism is making its way into the U.S. Very interesting so far. I just started. I had a lot of suggestions or recommendations for it. So it's a really good book yeah. so far. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Another question. Trevor Burrow. I've been developing systems for tracking, as you've mentioned in a recent post. How do you track how you spend your time, what you eat, and et cetera? What do you use for analytics to see if you're improving? So the eating one is actually really easy. I use my fitness pal, I think is what it's called. And okay. so after a meal, I go in there. So for example, this morning, I had two fried eggs and a, uh, a protein shake. So I just go in there and I just write down that that's what I had. If I have a snack or a drink or something else throughout the day at lunch, I'll probably have, you know, six to eight ounces of, of meat. I don't know if it's going to be venison or beef or moose, but I'll have something and I'll usually have a vegetable with it, but I just write it all down. Um, I used to weigh it all. I don't really weigh it anymore because I have a pretty yeah. good idea of what six to eight ounces of, of meat looks like. So um, that's nice because if you track it, then you become more efficient. And my fitness pal also knows what your regular eating habits and routines are. So it actually saves the food that you eat regularly as a, like a saved item, a, a preferred item. So you can just go in there. There's another cool little feature. I don't eat a lot of food that you have to scan with a barcode because what, what do you have to scan with a barcode? Processed foods. So I don't eat a lot of that food, but my fitness pal does have one where you can scan it and it'll upload all of the data automatically. So that's pretty cool. But the fact that you're tracking is powerful because what you track obviously is going to improve and you're going to be more mindful of that. I think just tracking food alone, not only is it kind of a hassle, uh, it just makes you more aware of the food you're stuffing down your gullet and it's more than you think. And it's less healthy than you think it is. <laughs> totally. Uh, tracking time. I, I don't, I don't actually track my time. I, I, I'm not sure that I ever have. I mean, you, but you, in you a way, use a calendar though. I use least. a calendar. Yeah. 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 And so I know that I'm going to be on this podcast for an hour and a half. That's the time that I have blocked. Uh, if I'm going to do emails in the morning, which is typically what I do, that's going to take me about 45 minutes, uh, store orders with my, with my children. That's usually going to take me anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour. I just know that because I'm just aware of how long it takes. And I use the calendar religiously and that's just Google calendar for me. Yeah. Cool. And then progress, of course, would be the battle planner, which is the tool that we use within the Iron Council. Uh, this brother, of course, already knows about that because he's in the Iron Council, but just kind of wanted to call that out. 
Yeah. Yeah. Use the, there's a battle planning app, uh, or there's the paper version, which is actually what I use. I use the paper version every day. I look at this and I'll write down what I need to get done for the week. I'll check it off as I go. I have non-negotiables in there. So this is obviously a very powerful tool, not just for me, but thousands and thousands of men have used this tool for the betterment of themselves. Yeah. All right. We got a long question. I've summarized this really well, but it's a really good question. You're going to say something. Yeah. Right before you get to that, I would say um, with tracking time, just go back and analyze your day and try to figure out what you did in the space that was something wasn't scheduled. Hmm. So for example, time wasters or potentially. Yeah. If I have, let's say I have, so this conversation between you and I, uh, I have it on my calendar. That's going to wrap up about 1230. Sometimes we get done earlier and that's cool, but it's, I'm, I'm blocked out till 1230 from 1230 to one is lunchtime, but then I might not have another meeting until two. So then I need to go back and review my day and actually determine what in the world I did before between one and two o'clock or or 12, uh, well, yeah, one and two, like, what did I do? I was on social media. Right. Or how long were you in the bathroom? Were you in there for three minutes it takes? Or were you in there for the 23 minutes? Isn't that in social media minutes? the same thing anyway? It is. <laughs> so you don't know how much time you're wasting unless you actually start to track it. Track so it, look yeah. for those little gaps uh, where you don't have it scheduled and figure out where you're you're losing time. Yeah. I In college, I don't even know what book this was, but I remember doing this in college and I was, I was complaining about not having enough time. I read some resource or I got coached or someone told me that said, track your day in increments of 15 minutes for an entire week and categorize the time. At the end of the week, I was like, yeah, I have plenty of time. Of course. It's just like you're tracking on my fitness pal. It, it, not only are we not eating healthy, once we track, we'll realize that, but we're wasting so much time. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And well, we, like today we I kicked of off our conversation by telling you I went to the post office. Well, the post office is 12 minutes away. Yeah. So I just wasted nearly a half hour round trip on going to the post office and it was completely unnecessary. I could have got through a few more emails or uh, worked on a project, or I could have recorded another Friday field notes in that time. Like there's a lot I could have done in that time. So we're losing a lot of time, whether we know it or not. Yeah, totally. All right. Clayton Biden. And in Clayton, I'm going to summarize, man, because your question's like a, a a journal here. So we might lose a little bit of the detail, but but we'll get the the gist of it. So he and I'm grabbing snippets of it. Last summer, I received a text text message from my girlfriend at the time, saying that she was positive that she got a positive pregnancy test. Keep in mind, we're in the same household at the time. Me needing time to process and think about what my future holds. I left her there, taking our dogs for a walk. She called and texted me frequently asking for me to come back so we could talk about it. He doesn't come back for a while. Hmm. Okay. Now, what's and, a while? Really? Like later that evening? Uh, 30, 30 minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes to get his mental state. Um, okay. By the time that they get in contact again with each other, she's already like, I'm out. Right. That day? And like so, that day she's gone? Um, oh, no, no, I'm this... sorry. He waits, he waits 30 minutes. He's, he can't ask these questions or I'm going to end up reading the whole thing. So when I did return after 30 minutes, still not really in a good mental state, I completely lost control of my emotions and reacted in the worst way possible. Saying things along the lines, lines of, I cannot do this because I have been thinking about breaking up with you. So he communicates that to her. Okay. okay. She obviously, like most of us, thinks that exactly in the way that he said it, Right. They've tried to communicate and sit down. He's attempted to apologize for that communication, see if she'd be willing to go to counseling together, right? And work through things. She has gone dark. She has moved four hours away from where they currently live up to current state here. Uh, We dated for almost two years. And the things we, we always used to say is how great of parents they would be. A week ago, she sent me an email stating how she plans to pursue 100% custody of our son and completely shut me out of the relationship with him. I've offered to come and speak with her and her parents and her therapist, her lawyers, et cetera. I have been completely denied. 
Now, as his birth is approaching, she is she is due next month. I intend to move to Cincinnati area where she's at. I'm looking to buy what I have, uh, what I believe is a good place, a piece of real estate with a house for my son. The inspection on the home is this week. I have been offered a job there making nearly 30K more. I made it known to her that I intend to move there to be close to my son, regardless of what happens between me and, and, and the relationship. However, she comes from a very wealthy family. And he has concerns, right, that she'll just get up and move again, you know, because she might be willing to do so. There was an element of this time period where they started talking again, and then she went dark. Um, and then ultimately, he's asking for any advice regarding the situation. Thank you so much for all that you do. I am incredibly grateful for your message and what you guys are doing for men around the world. Okay, so the first Tip thing, summary. it sounds like you handled yourself very poorly in the moment and you got emotionally freaked out and then dumped all those emotions on her, which I, you know, I understand. I get it. Not, I'm not condoning it of course, but I understand. So you freaked out, you dumped it all on her. She got scared. She took what you said to heart. She bailed. And now she's not interested anymore. Yeah. So number one, hopefully lesson learned. That's, we cannot allow our emotions to dictate our response to situations. Now we can take, look, you stepping outside for 30 minutes. I don't see anything wrong with that. Yeah. Within reason, you know, I would, I wouldn't say yeah. she, she says, and then you leave and bolt and like, no, but like, Hey, okay. Ooh, that's a lot. Let me, let me have 30 minutes and come back and regain the composure that, that I don't think that was wrong. I think that was probably wise. But then you freaked out. You came back and you did, you freaked out on her again. So hopefully lesson learned. Um, I, I would say it sounds like what's done is done. It sounds like she's not interested. Uh, it sounds like she's pursuing her own interest and what she thinks is in the best interest of the baby. Uh, and I can't really fault her for that. And I, I won't say that she's right or wrong. I just can't fault her for, for taking that, that angle. But here's what I would say. You are the father and you also have rights and there's things that she can and cannot do. And if you're interested in being in this child's life, like it sounds like you are, then you need to make sure that you protect your rights and the rights of your child just as much as it sounds like she's willing to do. And it might be a battle and it might be expensive. And there might be a lot of hardship and frustration and headache in this. And you need to be aware of that. You know, you can't, it would be like going into battle, but not knowing how difficult war is. You know, people romanticize war and they talk about heroes and winning and how virtuous it is. And then you get into war and it's murder and it's dark and it's, 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 it's atrocious. You got to be realistic about what this is going to take. And I can't tell you whether or not to do it. If it were me, I would pursue a relationship with my child at whatever cost, because I think that's the right thing to do. So you're going to have to find a lawyer. You're going to have to hire that lawyer and you're going to have to go to, to battle for your, your rights as a father. Totally. Yeah. That's, if that's you what might you well. want to do, then that's what it's going to take. Those are the tools of, not, of war in this case. Yeah. And not to go negative town. But uh, the probability is it's it's going to be really tough and it's not going to financially, it's going to be a huge financial burden. It's going to be highly stressful. But this is where I think the focus of getting clear on how you're going to show up regardless of those things and get really clear what what battle you're willing to fight. And don't determine that later. Determine that now yeah, going into it. Call. So you can just execute. Um, I, I've I would had say to do also, this, by Kip, the way. Like, on this, yeah, I do ahead. want to hear that. But I would just say the other thing too is, I, I don't want this to come across as this is the way it's going to be, but you might you might go into it first as best you can. It sounds like you guys really aren't talking um, to negotiate terms. That's usually what people will do before they go to battle. And yeah. it might be worthwhile to sit down together if, if she will with with attorney with by yourself if you can or with attorneys or a mediator 
and and start to negotiate some of the terms because maybe it doesn't need to escalate to that point. I just, I want to throw that out there. That's what you would do first before you hire an attorney and you say, it's war now, well, hold on. She might not want that either. She might just be defensive and feels like she has to lawyer up. And you pressing that way might push that a little harder, but there might be some negotiating here. Sorry to interrupt, Kip. I just want yeah. to throw that disclaimer there. No, I mean, you bring up a really good point. And there's there's power and empathy, um, whether she's being unfair or not. There's power and understanding. I mean, let's be frank. Like, we're we're kind of saying that right now. I understand her. Hey, I'm pregnant. I'm excited. We're going to have a kid together. And you lash out like, oh, man, I was planning on breaking up with you. And you're freaking out. Are you joking? You come back to the table and say, oh, I want to be with you. I wouldn't believe it if I were her. You're only saying that because you're she's pregnant. She doesn't want to be with a guy that doesn't want to be with her. You know? So, like, have some empathy, mostly from the perspective of understanding her and understanding the situation and bring that to the table. Most of us will lash out when people lash out on us, right? So have some tactics, right? Go into the situation um, in a in a good way. One, one thing that that crosses my mind and it's rooted in that same exact concept is, uh, you know, you might be tempted to be very frustrated with her. And, and I know the baby's not born yet and that's just coming, but like, you, you got to get that straight in your head. You might as well get that straight in your head now that you're never going to talk ill of her, that you're going to respect your child by respecting his mom and, and really like, and, and the better let me say it this way, the, the, the quicker that you can let go of your frustration and your heart of war against her, the better you're going to deal with the circumstance. And, and that's found in letting go and being okay with how she's the decisions that she's making and not lash out on what that means about you or how that affects you. The sooner you can get to that, the better you're going to deal with the circumstance. So might as well start down that path now and not wait. The one thing too, and that's all really good advice. One thing I hear right now is I hear all the alpha social media men, like I'm an alpha, like I hear all these guys and they're like, no, go to war. Like she's a bitch. And like, I hear that in, in them already. And what I would say to that is, you know, maybe there's some truth to that. I don't know. I don't, I don't know this woman. So I'm not going to jump to that conclusion. Maybe she's not, you know? Yeah. But what I would say is by doing it this way, what you're saying, Kip, empathy, negotiation, talking openly with her about this as the first line of attack, not only is it the right thing to do as a man, it's the prudent thing to do because it might actually save you a lot of time, energy, money, resources, headache, frustration, contention. So not only is it being a virtuous, righteous man, it's actually a really prudent strategy so you don't blow up all your own resources. So if, if, if there's a guy listening right now and he's like, no, go to war with this bitch about this. And like, well, that's not prudent. Now you might need to, it might get to that. I don't know. We're not there yet. So let's be prudent. Let's be wise and intelligent and go with the, the, the best course of action first. And then it can escalate as needed from there. Totally. Totally. All right. All right. Kevin Nickel. What key components have you identified to begin a business? What must you do to be successful starting from ground zero? Uh, well, I think the first thing is you got to ask yourself if you have a solution to somebody's problem that it, and, it's that, and that it's relevant enough. Mm. Because if it isn't, I mean, you could create the coolest Gidget or Wismo or solution or you know strategy that you think but you don't actually get to determine what value is. That's what a lot of people get wrong. And, and especially in the culture where it's a, our culture now is a lot about our own self-worth and how valuable we are as people. That's, that's like the culture these days. And that's good to a degree, except for you have to realize that you don't actually get to, ter to determine what is valuable. The person that you want to sell it to does. So if I want to sell you a product that's $100, you actually are the one that has to believe it's worth $100. And I could talk about it till I'm blue in the face. If you don't think it's $100 worth $100, you're not going to pay $100 for it. So I would do some, some market research. And by that, I mean, look at what your potential clients might 
be looking for? Uh, what solutions are already available and present? How many companies and, and organizations are already offering solutions along the same line as what you have to share? Do you have anything unique or different that isn't already available? But go out and do some market research and figure out. Let's say that you feel like you have a product or a service that would really be valuable for somebody. This is huge. Learn how to market using digital technology. I'm talking about social media. I'm talking about Facebook ads. I'm talking about podcasting, audio resources, video resources like YouTube. You have to get really, really good at using these resources. If, if you're not going to do it or, or you don't know how to do it, your product or service is never going to have any wings. So you have to have a good product, A, and then you have to be able to explain and illustrate and communicate to the right people that you have a good product. And when you get that figured out, you're, you're well on your way to having a successful business. Yeah. The only thing I'd add is don't fall into the pitfall that, that everyone feels like they need the brick and mortar store all like, I'll, I just use an example. One of my buddies, he's, um, he's a black belt in Muay Thai and he's, great instructor. He, he does privates and whatnot. And he was like, Oh, I'm going to open up a school. And he thinks that he needs to get a business loan, build a building on the side of the street, you know, have this major investment, blah, 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 right. In, in this given neighborhood, which to your point, Ryan, he has no idea if there's even a market for in his area. He hasn't checked on whether how many other schools exist, like, like, but he thinks that the building needs to be there. And, and my recommendation to him was go to the rec center in that neighborhood and sign up to teach classes at the rec center and validate if there's a market there first. And if you get a bunch of students, you get some general cash flow going, then you step it up and then you rent a place from another building, right? You sublease it underneath someone else. And then eventually you get the building, but don't totally. fall into that pitfall. If you have a great service, awesome. Go sell it to someone. Find one company and try to sell it to them. Yeah. And if you can't sell it to them, you know, start wondering whether you actually have a unique product or a service that's going to be valuable or not. And if you can't sell it to one and it gives you reps, right? Oh, I sold it once. Hey, there's some momentum here. Now I can have a referral. I can ask for a testimonial. I could like look for that unique, the, the minimal viable product of some or service, I should say, and get some reps. And try it out. It doesn't have to be this packaged, you know, product and service with a with a store and a billboard down the road. It it and if you're gonna fall into that pitfall and you're not gonna take action when when it's something that big. Yeah. You know what I would do with the Muay Thai one? I may, maybe I missed part of this, but one thing I would do is if I was in that situation, is I would go to all the martial arts gyms in the community that aren't teaching Muay Thai. And I would say, Hey, look, I'm I'm an instructor. Here's why I'm qualified. Here's why I think it can be valuable and a value add to what you're doing. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to come in and instruct two nights a week and we'll market this to your current students and we'll, we'll split revenue. You know, I'll take 50%. Let's I'm just throwing out arbitrary numbers. I'll take 50% and the school yeah. keeps 50. If they're my people that I bring in, I'll take 80 and pay you 20. So that way you're building revenue on something that wasn't previously available now I'm getting paid as I start and develop my own business. If I bring in my own clients, I'm paying this guy money that he has, doesn't have to pay a single dime for. There's so many cool totally. opportunities that reduce risk and let you know if you have a viable product. Totally. And in that example, you still use your brand for your mm -hmm. portion of your teaching. You set up your company as an S Corp. So it's a legal identity already. So you get the tax benefits in this circumstance. You're not an employee of the other school, right? Like there's all these things that you can do. And that's a perfect example of how you can get some serious reps and generate some cash flow sooner than later and not wait for the, the picture perfect scenario, right? Yeah. I mean, I did the same stuff. thing in my financial planning practice. I went out and I marketed to my friends and my family and I got some referrals here and there. And that was good. You know, it's fine. But when it really started to take off is I went to ancillary type businesses, health insurance agents, CPAs, yeah. attorneys. And I said, look, here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to handle the financial affairs for, for these people. And 
there's some legalities there that they're not licensed. I can't pay them, things like that. But some of these yeah. attorneys and even CPAs ended up having licenses so I could split revenue and commissions. Uh, then what I would do is I would go out of my way for all of my clients. If they needed insurance or they needed legal service or CPA work, I would refer to them. So I didn't, it didn't feel like I was just mooching off of them. This was a reciprocal relationship. And my practice totally. really started to blow up when I did that effectively. Totally. In the early days of my consulting practice, I was an independent contractor, right? And I would sub underneath larger firms, but I didn't sub as Kip Sorensen. I subbed as Soren. And so what would happen is I would line a contract with another firm for the Department of Defense and Soren was on the books doing that work. Now, what would happen? And I and I would make sure not to white be whitelisted, right? So I I I wanted whoever I was working for to know that I was a sub of that other company. I didn't want to pretend I was an employee. And through that process, you know how many clients I ended up getting of like large consulting firm, like large, large companies. Like one of my clients, Balfour B, one of the largest construction firms in the world, does direct work with my consulting firm. Yeah. Why? Because they were referred from Parsons Brinkerhoff, which did direct work with me as a subcontractor. Like, man, it, there's ways to do this. And it's not like, it's not what you think you have to do. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's way better avenues to, to pull off this kind of work. So even order of man was very similar to that because we started podcasting and I would go on other people's podcasts. Like one of the first big podcasts that I went on was MF CEO, which is now real AF with Andy Frisilla. Uh, he invite, I invited him on my show. He invited me on his, and I can't tell you how often I hear from people that, Hey, I started listening way back when you were on MF CEO, uh, or another one is warrior poet society network. I do videos for them on their, their private video catalog library network. And there's a lot of people, a lot of men who come into our fold, uh, and they were introduced through the credibility that warrior poet society network has. That's, that's how you build good partnerships with yeah. good people and magnify your reach because you're tapping into other people's credibility. Yeah, totally. All right. Elijah Henry, are you still attending the Baptist church? And what differences have you noticed from the Mormon church? Um, yeah, I do. I do go to the Baptist church. I, I've, I've been doing that for about six months. You know, as far as differences, I actually don't really want to get into that. And I'll, and I'll tell you why I don't want to get into that because I don't, I'm fairly new in the Baptist church and I don't think that I would be credible if I were to say this one church is different <laughs> in this way when I don't really right. have a broad perspective on, I mean, there's things that obviously are different. You know, we spend a lot more time looking into and, and reading and pondering the Bible relative to the book of Mormon. You know, that's a, that's an obvious yeah. difference. Um, yeah. But you know, all the other things, the doctrine is different. You know, it is. There's some similarities, but it's different. But outside of that, there's good people in both places. Um, I've, I've felt the spirit strongly. We have good friends who have been really involved. Uh, I, I really enjoy our pastor. Um, he's very well researched, very well studied in, in the Bible and in theology. And so I enjoy it. But as far as the differences, it's not a fair thing for me to say because I've only been to one Baptist church for a short period of time. And I don't feel like Copy. I can give you a a good, a good difference on that. Well, this is a, a good kind of related question. So Caleb judge, his question is how much does your faith influence your everyday life? And has your faith grown stronger since you've given up alcohol? Uh, my faith is something that has been challenged in the past and, and not challenged, but maybe I should say challenging. Uh, I haven't always relied on as much faith as maybe I could have otherwise or should have possibly. <laughs> Uh, Would you say as much as you have in the past, you know what I mean? Like this, like that has evolved, like that has gone down and yeah. up also. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's increasing. It's growing currently, I would say. And yeah. so I'm trying to be more mindful because I've implemented certain practices into my life that I really wasn't consistent with before prayer, pondering the Bible, um, having, having theological type discussions with people who are credible and can share information. I've had a lot of good conversations with neighbors and friends and members of the congregation, uh, pastor. So yeah, it's, it's, I'm trying to let more of that into my life. And I would say that 
that the not not drinking alcohol is has been a huge change in that regard because there's nothing there's there's less you're that, more there's aware. less of a barrier I'm more I'm more awake I'm more aware I mean physically yeah. obviously but mentally emotionally I have a lot more energy uh I I I am trying to live virtuously like there's so much more that I I would say I either I don't know what's more accurate that I either shorten the gap between myself and God or that I took this like barrier and obstacle and just lifted it and moved it out of the way and the line of the the line of communication is more clear sure. maybe it's a combination of both I don't know but yeah I think it's I mean, everything's better when you're not drunk all the time. I mean, that's yeah. pretty self-evident, but I could tell you all the ways that I've been better, but physically, mentally, I'm sharper, I have significantly more energy. Um, I'm more focused. I'm more clear. I'm more able to accomplish my goals. I'm more engaged with my wife and kids. I'm more focused on the business. Like every aspect of my life is I sleep better. I look better. My confidence has increased. <laughs> like every aspect of my life is better because I'm not drinking alcohol. Yeah. How has that, I mean, obviously it's been a focus, I think, right. And and you just said the removal of alcohol that has increased. Um, how does that influence in your day to day? Like, how does that show up in your day to day? Just faith. Yeah. I mean, I, I pray, you know, I pray quite often. Uh, that's, that's been a big deal for me. And one of the questions I often ask myself is what should I do in this situation? Yeah. And I think that's a spiritual question for me. You know, I might not say, God, what do you want me to do? I, I I'm not, but the you're, most spiritual. you're putting a moral compass on it though. Go yes. on. What should, what should I do? Should I do? Yeah. What is the right thing to do? You know, and, and we yeah. tend to look at our circumstances and situations and, and we play mental gymnastics with it. Right. And the mental gymnastics are usually a justification of the thing that you actually did want to do. And now you're trying to justify doing it, even if you know it's, it's not hard. the right thing to do. Uh, yeah. and, and I've said it before, do the right thing. And people are like, well, what's the right thing? Guys, we know, right? We, we, we know, know yeah. what the right thing is. And I am attempting to do the right thing without taking into consideration the consequence. Because the more that we take into consideration the consequence of doing the right thing, the less likely we are to do the right thing. Because doing the right thing is often the harder path. Yeah. You know, having a difficult conversation is a hard path. Or, you know, maybe not taking advantage of that one client that you would have before. I, I don't know how that would manifest itself, but doing the right thing is the harder path. And we know we should take it. So you got to stop looking at the consequences so much. And I think we do the right thing because just because it's the right thing to do, not yeah, because of totally. what'll happen or what, no, you do what's right because it's right. Intrinsically, it's the right thing. Yeah, totally. We're, we're in the process of defining our, our family kind of ethos right now. And, and that's what actually one that we stole from Matt Brudeau was the right thing's always the right thing. Yeah. Period. For sure. And, and, and you don't have to be an even adult to know that, right? I could ask my, my, my nine-year-old, you know, is it the right thing? <sighs> yes. No, like, yeah, they right, know, yeah. they know what's right, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's powerful. Well, and I think, um, and it's interesting how there's, there's even soft areas of life where that shows up. You know, we, we were talking last week, I think it was on Brock or maybe it was on our leadership group in, in the iron council. Maybe it was there. Shoot. Now I don't remember, but regardless, we we're talking at one point and about accountability conversations and holding people accountable. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't do it. Why? Because of the mental gymnastics of, well, yeah, but if I talk to Ryan about this, then our, our relationship might go sideways or he'll be offended or whatever. It's like, stop. Should I talk to Ryan about this? Yes or no? Yeah. If the answer is yes, then find a way to do it tactfully and correctly and try to mitigate issues. But we jump to the issue. We jump to the results instead of just asking, should or should I not? You, I think what act. you said is, and I, this really 
this is what I took away because you said this. It was on the Brocker call, and and you said, uh, what we typically do is we prioritize how we're going to do something when we should be prioritizing what we should be doing. Mm, yeah. So that sounds way better. I said that. Are you sure? Well, I I put it in a pretty package. <laughs> or did you word that's what it you for said. me? Okay. <laughs> that's what you said. But I remember you saying anyways. But but uh yeah, we spend so much time like, oh, how am I gonna let this person down? Or how am I gonna tell this person? How am I gonna do this? Well, hold on, let's figure out what you should do first. Like you've already made up your mind and maybe you came to the wrong conclusion. We need to figure out what. So for example, I think what we were talking about is friends that knew that I had a problem with alcohol and didn't. And when I confessed, when I told them, they're like, oh, we knew. And I'm like, what? You didn't tell yeah, me? Didn't well, say something? I didn't know how to broach it. I didn't want to make it, you feel bad or awkward or whatever. And so they were worried about all of these consequences to how they would do it, that it led them to not taking proper action, which is what a friend would do is say, hey, man, I'm concerned. Like you got a problem and I see it. And the, and taking the action was the priority versus the how we can figure out the how, and there are the right ways to approach certain subjects, but the, what actually approaching it, that's the most important factor. And then we can go from there. Yeah. Guys have a lot of questions around the whole spirituality thing uh, today. So Jimmy bars, his question, how do you personally lead your family spiritually? Hmm. That's a good, that's a good question. Cause that's an area that again, I've struggled with. I, I think, you know, leading them to church obviously is important. Uh, making sure that, that we're up and that we're ready and that we're focused on, on the message and that you're creating an environment that's conducive to receiving spiritual direction and guidance. That's the type of music we listen to. That's how we treat each other. That's how we dress. That's the way that we go about our church services and uh, the Sabbath day. That's important reading scriptures, praying with your children, getting them involved in prayer, complimenting them on, you know, every night when we sit down for dinner at the dinner table, one of us says a prayer. And if my daughter, for example, is saying the prayer, I will usually compliment her specifically on one thing that was very thoughtful. You know, Hey, that was a thoughtful mm -hmm. thing that you said. I really appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah. Or, hey, in the future, make sure you forgot to bless the food. It's important we bless the food because X, Y, and Z, right? Yeah. So you're coaching, you're instructing, you're honoring, you're, you're encouraging and you're fostering that connection. Um, but this is an area that I'm not great at you. I think you're more qualified to talk about it than I am, Kip. Yeah. You know, ironically, <laughs> I was like, you know what, maybe I'll share what I do wrong instead of what I do. It's probably the right way to do it. <laughs> here, here, here's my number wrong. My number one wrong is how I show up. And mm. if, if I'm pissed off and I come in the house and I'm, the stolen wall of my wife and I'm all full of anger and hatred and, you know, maybe hatred sounds a little extreme, but you know, I'm, I'm not in a good spiritual state and Asia goes, Hey, it's time for to read scriptures. Do you, do you think I show up to read scriptures in a really positive light in that scenario? No, I'm like, Oh man, yeah, I'm contributing zero in that example. And, and most importantly, am I in a spiritual state that is in line with where, where I want my kids to be? And when I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not leading anybody. If anybody, I'm probably detracting from yeah. what exists in our household. You brought That's up an my interesting number one point. blocker. Yeah, you brought up an interesting point about Asia saying, hey, everybody, it's time to read scriptures. And that's actually similar to the way that my house has been in the past. And- I don't think that is exclusively how it should go because what ends up yeah. happening is, and look, I'm not good at this. So I'm kind of just shooting off yeah. the cuff a little bit here and thinking about things I need to do better. So I'm speaking more to myself in this context, but I'm not sure. Well, I am sure that that's not how it should be because if it is, and this is why we have a, such a feminization in the church because it's women. They want to get addressed if she didn't. Yeah. Right. Hey, let's talk about kindness and empathy and compassion and consideration. All great things to consider, but that's a fem the more of a feminine approach to the gospel. A more masculine approach is strength, courage, honor, conviction. And if I did a better job 
bringing those lessons and those stories from the Bible and that side of the equation, it would be a more well-rounded approach to the gospel. Wouldn't be so feminine, and we would be able to inject more of the masculinity that is inherently infused into scripture. We just don't do a good job articulating it, or at least I don't. So yeah, I appreciate asking the question because it's got me thinking about what I need to do better. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Let me ask you this, because I I find this interesting. And 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 I guess my question to you, Ryan, is do you feel what how would you package this up? And and do you think this is probably a common thing for men? If I would show up that way, and, and I'm not saying this is good, by the way. So this isn't like an excuse or anything. Um, but it's interesting how if I were a single father that that spiritualness in the in the home and bringing that to the table and making sure that happens and me showing up more powerfully would totally be present I'm but not because sure, I'm, I'm not, married I'm sure I understand oh god if, if but but if got but it. if but if I was but when I'm married I'm like oh well you know I'm gonna outsource that right or yeah. it doesn't become a priority because I know it will be handled and then I would get withdrawn and I'm presiding less in those examples versus if I was running solo as a father, you know, I'd kind of rise through the occasion a little bit better, right. Than I do when I'm not, when I'm not required to. Yeah. I I'm sure that's the, either that, or as a single father, maybe you wouldn't do it at all. Yeah. And maybe there'd be no spiritual element of that when the kids are with you. That's something yeah. to consider as well. <laughs> would their, yeah, would sure. their spiritual development be stunted because you're not talking about that at all. But what recommendation would you give guys where they've they've checked out of maybe certain areas because they do have a spouse and they know it will get handled and in some of those because I do think that is a common pitfall whether it's the involvement of our children in their schooling or other areas where we've kind of stopped quote unquote presiding because you know it's getting handled. Yeah, that's a trap, right? I mean, that's that's a beautiful thing about our, our wives and the people that we're partnered with is they're so strong and capable and can do so much. They're independent and capable and intelligent and hardworking and dedicated and committed. And so we're like, check. I don't need to do that because she's got it all taken care of. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you I was great in this department. I'm not. It's very easy for me to focus on the business aspect of my life and say, hey, well, I'm the breadwinner. I'm doing I'm doing this work. Doing and, you know, un yeah. unfortunately, I think that realization happens too little too late at times uh, and, and the relationship is no longer salvageable, but it doesn't have to get to that point. And so I would suggest that you and your wife sit down and you communicate about what she's doing and what you're doing and what her role is and what your role is. And by the way, they're not mutually exclusive. Like if you're homeschooling your children, and this is something I've fallen prey to and guilty of is that, okay, that's her role. No, it's not her role. It's, it's our role. And I yeah, don't just get to, like you said, yeah. outsource all of it. There's things that I do. So um, lately I've been a little bit more involved with making sure that they're getting their work done. Um, I teach science to them on Wednesdays because that, that was an agreement that we came to where I could be involved in it. Um, we do, we do projects. We built a volcano the other day with my son. Uh, and so it's, I'm not outsourcing it anymore. I'm actually actively engaged in it. Uh, same thing with cooking. You know, the dynamic in our house is my wife cooks. Well, is that, does that have to be the dynamic? I've started to cook a little bit more and I usually cook with my daughter. We do Sunday breakfast and Tuesday dinner. That's my cooking nights and day. And it's fun. You know, it gives, it gives yeah. my wife a reprieve from that. Uh, my daughter and I are more connected. I didn't really know how to connect with her very well. So we can connect over that. It's awesome. So yeah, we should get yeah. involved in every aspect of our family's lives. And it gives the family opportunity to have intermittent fasting whenever uh, dad's cooking on, on Sunday and Wednesday nights. Not for nights, me, you know? bro. I'm a great cook. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm good at whatever I do. So if I decide to start taking up cooking, then I'm going to be a great cook. Uh, no, there's been know, some nope. hit or miss meals. Uh, so <laughs> I'm about 60, 40, 60, good, 40, bad. Yeah. That's well, and I, I'm, I'm joking because I cook, I have two meals. I cook, there's two things I make and my kids know those are the two things I make. The problem is I never make those two things like maybe <laughs> once or twice a year. Right. So, so guys, I, if you want to know, 
if you want to get better at cooking, here's what I would suggest. And this is what I've been doing is instant pots are incredible. Number one, <laughs> like if you could do anything, I've done enchiladas, moose rose, chili, instant, look into instant pot. And my daughter got me this, uh, cookbook with instant pot recipes. Awesome. And then sheet pan meals is the other one. So between those two, I'm learning a lot on those two. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Richard Ray, when it comes to journaling, most men I've talked to in my group, myself included, have either been inconsistent with it or have done, never done it. While I know some questions we might ask ourselves are specific to goals we have, but can you share some other good questions we might be asking ourselves? Maybe something that helps you stay more consistent with journaling. Yeah. I So a couple of prompts that I use is number one, tell, how, how was today? That's it. How was today? To share how the day was. Right. Hey, today I started off. I went to the gym. I felt pretty good. I felt strong, increased in weights, got home. Everybody was kind of ornery. They woke up on the wrong side of the bed and that made me feel dot, dot, dot. And here's how I responded. I did this well, but then I kind of lost my patience with my son and I did this and that wasn't good. So tomorrow I'm going to do this. Narrate it. Narrate your day. Yeah. You know, if you narrate your day, you're going to start to see objectively what your day actually looks like. And you might find out, hey, I showed up pretty well today. Or you might find out that I thought I showed up well, but I actually didn't. And then you come up with a plan for tomorrow. So that's another prompt. In what area of my life could could I use some improvement? And how I'm, am I going to show up tomorrow to improve in that department? Uh, one prompt I've used quite a bit is when I'm feeling down, whether it's sad or angry or any range of emotions that we experience. I document that. I write that down. Hey, I'm feeling this way because, or if my wife says something to me and it triggers me emotionally, and we say we're above it, but we're really not. You know, we get yeah. pissed off. I need, I want to write that down because it's probably not what she said that pissed me off. It's the way that I interpreted it and the way that that interpretation made me feel about it. And that usually comes from something else. It could come from another experience that we had or some sort of trauma that we internalized as young boys. And now your wife does it. Like maybe she's, uh, she's talking about a coworker who happens to be a male and you feel yourself getting super jealous. Okay. What's going on here? Like, is there infidelity issues or is it that you're just getting jealous for no reason because you had a past experience where maybe your, your first wife cheated on you? And now you're dragging that into the relationship. That's going to create some real problems. So you need to get to the root of those issues. And journaling is very powerful to be able to do that. Uh, Another prompt that I use is lessons that I've learned that I would like my children to know. So if my children got a hold of my journal in 10 or 20 years, what, what would I like it to say? Like, what would I want them to learn? What, what, lessons from life would I want them to extract and I will write in the context of them at some point reading. So I think between those four or five things, you have an unlimited number of variables in your life to talk about. Totally. I'll share. I'm just all about sharing my own pitfalls today. So one pitfall that I had around journaling is I would, I would write too much. (laughs) So I'd end up writing so much that tomorrow I'd be like, uh, I don't want to journal today because it, last yesterday it took me an hour and it, you know what I mean? It was like this, it was too much of a chore. The barrier I created for journaling was too much. So I took the equal prompts, right? That you're already giving, but they're short and sweet. And I, and I limit my time. I'm like, I'm journaling for 15 minutes, 50 minutes are up. I, I, I wrap up the thought and I move on. Yeah, And that ensures that tomorrow I'll do it, but it's when I was journaling and I'm trying to catch up and backlog and that it was too much. And then I never want to do it again because it's too much of an effort. Yeah. I, I have my journal just right over here in that drawer and I will put it, pull it out in the middle of the day. If I had an experience again, for, for me, journaling is a way to uh, come to terms with my emotions because uh, yeah, as men, we just clear, don't have clarity. On yeah. It, right? Clarity, but under, yeah. Understanding. So that, so I'm not so emotional because that's the problem. If we suppress our emotions, we're actually more emotional than if we would just let them out in a healthy way. So for me, it's, you know, I'm really mad right now. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Okay. 
stop. Like you said, take 10 minutes, just write down. Hey, I had this experience with a client and it went really poorly and it made me feel inadequate because, uh, you know, I, I, I felt disrespected by the client or what, I don't know, whatever, just write it down. I promise you just getting it out and, and getting it out of your head is therapeutic. And then you can also learn from it so you can react better next time. Yeah. That that's my takeaway on this podcast actually is I I don't do that when I'm upset. I I journal in my window in the morning when I do, but I don't use it as like a tool of like getting my thoughts out and processing. I actually really like that. That's powerful. Yeah. It's really powerful. Thanks. Uh, Tom Piccolo, after your wife has lost respect for you, can you ever get it back and how my wife called the cops and now things that I, that I should have just thinks that I should have just forgiven her. I feel that she has lost respect and played the ultimate card right now. I am only with her to keep my house. There's a lot here. (laughs) Wait. So the first part of the question made it sound like she lost respect for him. And the second part of the question makes it sound like he lost respect for her. Or maybe she just lost respect for him because he's only with her for the wrong reason anyway. Right. So I think there's a lot there. Do you want me to read it one more time? No, I think I got it. Got it. Uh, well, number one, respect is is a uh, it's not a symptom. It's what's the right word? It's a result. It's a result of trust. It's a result of trust. So the hard part with respect is that it takes a long time to develop it, especially when you're talking about hurt people, and all of us are hurt because we've all been cheated. We've all been We've all made bad choices. We've all been wronged. We've all been taken advantage of. So all of us are hurt. And a lot of men have unresolved hurt, meaning they were hurt and they never addressed it and got to the root of it. And so they, they, they can't, they can't get past it. They have trust issues. They don't trust people. They don't even really trust themselves in a lot of ways. So if you find yourself not trusting people, it might be a result of un unaddressed hurt or pain in your life. Uh, The other problem with trust is that it can be eroded very, very quickly. I mean, if you, for example, step out on your wife, that can erode years and years and years of trust that you've been building up through your actions. So the answer is, Yes, you can build respect back up, but it takes a rebuilding of trust, which can't happen overnight. And the way that we build trust is we honor our word. That's it. Like that's yeah. that is the foundational truth of or element of trust is honoring your word. So when you say you're going to take out the trash, you take out the trash. When you say you're going to do a project, you do the project. When you say you're going to pick up the kids, you pick up the kids. When you say you're going to coach the team, you coach the team. When you say you can't do something because you can't do it because of work, then then you have to honor that too. Like, hey, hon, I told you, remember, I can't yeah. do it. Because even that is undermining trust. When she comes and tests, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, she says, hey, uh, right. I know you said you're working late today, but can you do this thing? That's a test of trust. And you need to be able to say, no, I can't do that thing because I committed to helping my friend move th- this evening. Remember that yeah. also is it's a, a way sense to of, build up trust. Yeah. It's a sense of consistency and reliability Yeah, in both sides of that coin. Right. Yep. And she sees that you're going to honor your word, not just to her, but other people. That's also important. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now that we've addressed that. My buddy, my buddy, Keith Yaki, he says this, he says, when the trust goes up, the lust goes up. And what he's saying is that the attraction goes up, right? When, when mm-hmm. a woman trusts you, the attraction goes up. But I would also say that you loving a person is, yes, it has an a, an a uh, component of emotion. You're emotionally connected to that person. Women are more in tune to that based on trust, but it's also a choice. Mm. It's a choice. And you say, what did he say? I'm only there because of the house situation. 
Is that what he said? I'm only with her to keep my house. That's a bad reason to be with somebody, but maybe it's all you need to have some other reasons to be with her. And you might need to choose in this season of your life to love her as opposed to emotionally being in love with her. Because you guys might be going through some really difficult things. I don't know what they are. And so you might have to make the choice of, I'm going to love this woman. Not for the house. But because I don't know if she's the mother of your children. I don't know, Cause, but because you choose to you choose to. That's why. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Now, in the meantime, there's things that you should do, right? If she's undermining trust or uh, or there's some issues that need to be addressed and maybe you need to go to counseling together. Maybe you need to have some deep and serious conversations. Absolutely do those things. But I would suggest to you that in the meantime, despite her flaws, because you have them, too, and I know you have them because I have them that we are going to choose to love our spouses because why that's what we said we would do when we said I do. And that's an element of trust. You said you would and honoring your word Yeah, you said you would. So now we'll find out because it's easy to honor your word when things are great, but the real test comes when things are not great. And you said you would, was that true or not? We'll find out. Yeah, I like it. And, you know, one thing that you said around just honoring our word for the establishing of trust, I, I think some of us will fall into the pitfall of taking certain action and then like immediately like, okay, did I get the result I needed? Is Ryan still, it, did I manipulate Ryan yet? Does he trust me yet? And it's like, guys, that, that's got to be rooted in 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 having integrity. And, and we got you almost have to just go, hey, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to honor my word, regardless of the byproduct of that, because it's going to take a while. And and while it's taken a while, you're going to look for results and you're not going to see the fruits of it. And you're going to be tempted to be like, throw your hands up and go, oh, see, I've tried, Ryan. I tried honoring my word and my commitments and it's not working and 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 then lash out emotionally because you're not seeing the results that you want to get. So you, it, this has got to be truly rooted in being a man of integrity, not trying to manipulate the situation and and control how her responses are uh, towards you. It's a great point. I get so many messages from guys who are struggling in their relationship, and at times I'm like, "Why are you asking me? <laughs> like, I don't know what to do." But I do know this. <laughs> I do know this, that regardless of how a situation turns out between you and your wife, for example, being in integrity and showing respect and being a man of your word is the right, again, this is the theme of this conversation. It's the right thing to do and your life will be better because of it. You might not salvage your marriage. That may be too far gone. But there's going to be other people. There's going to be another woman who comes into your life. Um, and not only that, it just is better for you as a human being to be a man of your word, to be the kind of man that you know you should have been all along. It's better for you. And it's better for everybody else involved. So like you said, being that man of your word is just, it's intrinsically valuable. And your motivation for doing it should not be so I can win my wife back. Yeah. Should not be so that I can make amends for things that I, it's so, it's because it's intrinsically what needs to happen. And the outcome, like we said earlier, is irrelevant as to why you're doing it. And isn't that powerful? I mean, that's more power. We talk about sovereignty. That's more powerful than basing your actions on what someone else will or won't do in response. Because it doesn't matter. I can't control you, Kip. I can't control my wife. So if I'm doing something for her to respond and react a certain way, I'm giving her all my power. Totally. I'm going to take the power back. I'm going to do what's right. If she responds positively, wonderful. If she responds negatively, too bad. I have the power and this is how I choose to act regardless of any outside factor. Yeah, it's profound. And I think, um, I actually think that's a good good place to stop if you're okay with that. Awesome. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. 
So call to action, gentlemen. Um, Iron Council, that's going to be opening up mid-March. So to stay in contact with us or to subscribe to the newsletter or to learn more about it in preparation for when we open up the Iron Council, go to orderofman.com slash Iron Council or connect with Mr. Mickler on Instagram or Twitter at Ryan Mickler. And of course, if you haven't joined us on our Facebook group, go to facebook.com slash group slash order of man. Um, update on the store, sir. Is there still discounts? Yes, yeah, still, well? still, still discounts. Trying to clear some inventory out in the store. Uh, so if you head to store.orderman.com and use the code 50, 50 at checkout. So 50 at checkout, uh, that will be automatically applied to your order. Excellent. All right, guys, that's it. We'll be back on Friday. Until then, go out there, take action, and become the man you are meant to be.